Good evening and welcome to Wana Live, the right <laughs> the reading series of the Writers Association of Northern Appalachia. I'm your host, Damian Dresick, and your other host is in Chicago and will be with us directly. Uh, but I am very excited tonight to be presenting Nancy Corbel, who uh, is a wonderful uh, friend from the University of Pittsburgh world. She has written everything from award-winning editorials to instructions on preparing frozen french fries, which I'm going to ask her about that. She teaches writing at the University of Pittsburgh and holds an MFA from Warren Wilson College and is a former recipient of a grant for the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. Her most recent work appeared in One and in Reaction. So let's bring Nancy out here. Hi, Damien. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, good evening. Thank you so much for making time to be on the show. So, what are you, you going to be reading for us tonight? Um, I'm reading two prose pieces. So um, we can think of them as long poems or prosy poems or something. So. Excellent. A genre close to my heart. Well, I'm going to disappear and, and uh, let, uh, let our audience hear what you've got. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, first piece is called Roses. I'm sitting on the couch talking to my father just weeks after my mother died. I almost wrote the first time my mother died. Did she die once before? Did I wish her dead or certainly absent? Yes and yes. Does one die a little from such wishing, even if no one says it to their face? The whole house shrunk when she got sick. Now it's my father's house but he doesn't want it anymore. Even though he's lived here so long, he can find anything he needs in the dark. It's my birthday, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here because my mother is dead and my father is alone. She died upstairs in her bed and I hoped it was a good death or at least not a bad one. We all said it was peaceful. There were no machines, no outside interference. It was private and when it was over, the hospice nurse silently wove the remaining opiates into a cup of coffee grounds while waiting for my father and I to get home. Before the men from the funeral home came to take my mother away, I pulled the sheets down to see if there was a mess in the bed. I thought a mess was what happened after death. She left none, but blue-gray electricity sparked and swarmed around her legs. I did not keep looking though the glow surprised me. She was creaturely then, alive in a different way and newly unfamiliar as she escaped out the cold February window. I want my father to remember my birthday, but he doesn't. Small thing, very small, petty of me perhaps to note it. I'm of the age where you stop needing birthdays, even though I've always liked mine, but my mother would never forget my birthday not on her life. As we're talking, if you call what my father and I do talking, I all of a sudden smell roses, though there are none anywhere in the house except for the long dead, long dried and faded yellow roses I bought my mother decades ago. A child's purchase, excuse me, sealed tight in a glass jar sitting on the coffee table between my father and me. And it's winter, there is no friendly weather outside. No scented breeze, so roses? Yellow roses were her favorite. I never thought to wonder or ask her why, though I sent them to her every year on her birthday. And at some point, she decided to send them to me on my birthday too, even though I don't especially care for roses. They are not my favorite. The smell of roses is so strong now, it rouses me from the stupor of sitting with my father Strong enough, I can't ignore it. I wonder if my father can smell it too, except I would never ask and he would never say. It's not that we're enemies, he and I, and it's not like I will miss my mother. But here she is, a silk wire of rose scent alive in late gray March, abundant, standing by. The Judgment. Being a nice guy was the whole problem. 
because everyone knows you don't succeed in this world by being a nice guy. My father could not catch a break, my mother said, meaning he could not shed the guaranteed misfortune of the good. He was always at risk of not selling well or enough, all because he was too nice a guy to be selling cars. I'm not sure if this was true. Rather, my father was the kind of man unlikely to say shit if he had a mouthful. Instead, he issued small, nasty comments meant to be understood as funny. I cannot share most of them with you. They are that unkind. I will say that he often quoted the professional wrestler, Ric Flair, who was famous for saying, win if you may, lose if you must, but always cheat. I was never sure who was winning or losing or cheating, only that all of this was some kind of kidding on the square. Over the years, he sold cars for many different dealerships, all of which bore the name of the men who owned them as well as the make of the car. Bud Donahue Chevrolet, Frank McGuire Ford, Bob Smith Ford. As my father's bosses, these men had considerable control over him and so over my mother and me. According to my mother, my father was nicer than those men and certainly nicer than his fellow car salesmen. But once in 1964, my father's parents lent him $20,000 to open his own used car lot. It bore our family name, Corbel's Auto Sales, and was located at 4911 Bomb Boulevard, which is now a KFC. The office was a large metal trailer with wooden steps leading up to a side door. A metal awning, maybe green, shielded the front windows, and there was a standalone cement garage in the back. Inside the office was a giant wooden desk with drawers of hidden things like pen knives and keys and a diamond ring he accepted in exchange for a car. I liked going there. It was on a boulevard in the city and smelled of paper and grease and my father's snuff. He did well for one year. That Christmas, he bought my mother a gold charm bracelet, a fake leopard dress with matching jacket, a stylish black shift, and a mink stole. She had nowhere to wear these things, but that wasn't the point. He was proud. He showed me the bracelet in secret prior to wrapping. But later that year, Corbel's auto sales closed for good. My last memory of it is my father and I standing in the doorway of the cement garage gazing at an ancient Ford Model T he'd hoped to restore. It was a gray day, as it so often is here, and possibly chilly. I knew he was sad, but not about the car necessarily. It was more than that. His failure to save it meant a permanent return to bosses. In the years afterward, there was trouble over that $20,000, which was a lot of money then and is still. My parents could not repay the loan, so my grandparents filed a judgment against them. I know this because my father kept a copy of the promissory note and the judgment at the bottom of an old file. It is confusing at first glance because the receipt reads Elmer Corbel versus Elmer Corbel. It's easy to miss the junior after my father's name, if you're not looking closely or if you're in a hurry. Here's the thing. I know what a judgment is, how paperwork is filed by one party against another to create a permanent record of a failure. I made it my business to understand such things so as to avoid them myself. There's also a letter from a lawyer to my parents noting the judgment was satisfied it does not state the means of satisfaction. All that is required are the right words on the right paper and a fee. Only that. Thank you. Hi, Christina. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry I joined late. I'm in Chicago and an hour behind. So. Yeah. I've always suspected your mortal enemy was the central time zone. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you know, I joined just in time for you to hear you say 
no friendly weather outside, and that's how it is here in Chicago. It's blustery, sleet, rain, cold. Oh. Um, I loved listening to your work, especially that reference to Ric Flair, the nature boy. And yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and all those WWE wrestlers from back in the day. And I was thinking as you were reading about what it does, you know, what does it mean to be a nice man? What is, you know, judgment and how, you know, people can appear on the surface to be a really nice person, but under their breath, there's more to the story. So I really love the, the depth that you took us to in your work. It was great. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love the, the way that in, in the second story, the way place took over. Mm -hmm. I'm always really interested in stories about place. And I, I felt like it was a wonderful, like, um, assembling of, of, of a specific kind of person in the only kind of place they could be. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's really, that's really an interesting and helpful comment. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of what I've, um, a, almost everything I write really is pretty place centric. So. Yeah, I, I like the, the there's there's very Pittsburghness to to the whole business and the Bomb Boulevard and you know I think anybody who's in Pittsburgh when they hear that they they imagine like the, the stages of Bomb Boulevard thinking about the KFC and and, and then you know it, it you know, hard times better times yeah 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 it's so interesting that KFC really strikes a chord with so many people and I just. <laughs> Which is great, but I just, it's, yeah. I, I have to admit, I, I, my, I bought my first ever new car at a, a car dealership on Bomb Boulevard. Did you? I did, in like 91 or something. Oh, wow. Yeah. I thought you were going to say at the KFC. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know what kind of cars they're selling there. But. Well, and it, it's interesting, too, the way that the ghosts, of our past, you know, sort of still live on, even though something else is now in that place. And now I, I know that every time I drive by where my grandparents' house once stood, it no matter, I know that it's not there anymore, but I look anyway. Right. Because I, I feel like, you know, I'm still being haunted in good and bad ways by something that used to be there and that used to matter to me and to my family. And I feel like that's the interesting part about place, how it never lets us go in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's really true. Yeah. And, and you do, you just keep, it's like you keep seeing the things that aren't there anymore, but. Well, and I really like the way you capture the, the sort of generational tension um, you know, and the sort of this very taciturn, you know, kind of, you know, I, I would never ask and he would never say, you know, that, that kind of types of people, but also the, the kind of, you know, how do we, how do we talk to our parents? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or not, or, or be with them and not talk with them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and how that relationship evolves and sometimes devolves over time. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like our, parents are the most honest and authentic before we ever can perceive it. You know, when we're toddlers and we're so young and, you know, they're not fearing judgment from us um, at that point. And then as we get older and they, we're developing as adults and as people with our own, you know, ideas and ways, in some ways, I think our parents close off to us and they don't, some of them never reopen. So, you know, I, I wonder about that too. And I, I think about people I know who've lost their parents when they were very young and they, they never get to know them, um, you know, as older adults and, and how that must stick with them. You know, what, what would their relationship have become over time? Right, exactly. Or just when you were saying that initially, I thought, you know, what would it be like if you could really remember what your parents were like when you were a child and if you you know if you had the the cognizance of your adult self that would be that would be something <laughs> especially in those early years when you know they're the sort of 
that wall isn't up yet and they're able to, Oh, goo, goo, God, you know, you, I mean, what, what, you know, who, who were they then? Because we all change. Right. Right. One way or the other. <laughs> we have a comment. Yes. Uh, this is from Anne Marie. Oh, Anne Marie. Hi. Thank you so much. <laughs> How wonderful that you listen. It's always great to get comments. Yeah, Emory's in Canada. Oh, cool. Yeah. Probably literally, but who knows with the weather these days. <laughs> <laughs> no, she, she is literally, yeah. She, yeah. Well, th th thank you for your contribution in making us international. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Nance. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm looking at, um, yes. I'm reading the wrong thing. Thank you so much, Nancy, for, for coming on tonight. Yes. Thank you, Damien. And thank you, Christina. Oh, by the way, Anne adds, ha, I'm from the frozen north, so it must be cold up there. <laughs> 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 it was. It was great to have you on. And we, we did wait. We did we have another comment. Yeah. Um, this is from Robbie Robinson. Oh, thanks, Rob. <laughs> thanks, guys. Now, wait. Are, are we... Are, are, are we supposed to have called you N Dog? <laughs> yeah, sure, you can. You I don't feel like we failed in some way as hosts, not to know that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for being here. Right. Uh, this was great. Your work is wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, we will see. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you all next week at 8 o'clock on Thursday. Yes. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, everybody.